Okay, so we have T7 case problem three, the widget mage. And like I always do when I first start, I have my preview pane here. I'm gonna click that into its own tab. That'll give me my sandbox URL and it'll let me view on a full page. Okay, and then I'm also going to read the summary. Um, before I can understand what I'm working on, I have to read the summary, and then I'll have a good idea of what it, my task ahead of me is. Uh, so the Widget Mage, Anna Lopez, is the founder of Widget Mage, a website that specializes in designing teaching materials and demos for people learning how to program. Anna has asked you to work on a page users can use to explore CSS topographical styles. Anna already has the JavaScript code written to make the demo page work and a style sheet for the page. She wants you to finish her project by writing the form controls for the demo. A preview of the page you'll create is shown in the figure below and I have a copy of that file. There we go. So this is what our finished product is supposed to look like. And this is what it currently looks like. So everything in this middle section here is what we're going to have to do. The rendered text box is going to get pushed down and we're going to have to put everything right in right in here. Okay, so now we can get started. First, we have to link our CSS files like we almost always have to do. We have to go into our demo HTML already there. Add a link to forms.css. Add a script element to load uh, the script file wmscript.js. So the CSS file first. We have a couple already, and I... I'm going to follow the dry method, don't repeat yourself, and I'm going to copy and paste that, and then change the file name. This one is called forms.css. Okay, there's no media parameter here, it's just going to be used as a style sheet for everything. And then we're going to add the script. I have to type that because there's not one to copy. The script has a source instead of an href. Uh, and that's because the script actually has an open and closing tag, and we could write our JavaScript right in here, uh, but in this case, we're going to use a file, script.js, and no other special settings, so just the source, script.js. All right, this Linking the CSS files, we do get a potential check mark for that. And we do, let's see what changed so far. Okay, nothing. So MindTap is probably actually looking specifically for the code. And they are, they're looking for the fact that we have written the code instead of looking at an image of our rendered page. Form elements, scroll down to the H1 heading h1 heading all the way down to here insert a form element you do not need to specify an action or a method at least not yet so we're going to create a form element all right that's it that's all we're doing right a form element it didn't say to put anything else in it That's the whole step. It's deceptively easy. I think we're going to get some hard steps here in the future. Text boxes. Inside the form, insert a text area box with the ID sample box for the field.
field sample text. Okay. Add the following attributes to the text area box. So the ID is going to be sample box. The field, the name of this is going to be sample text. We're going to put this at the top of our form. So they said it's a text area. We can do a text area. Okay, the ID of it is what they've said, sample box. And the, when they say field, they mean the name. All right, they want this to be put into the The, the name value so that this will be sent with the form and when the form gets submitted. Um, and that's going to be sample text. So name equals sample text. And I have some other things to set. I'm going to add my closing tag so I don't forget it and now I'm going to read the following instructions for it. add placeholder text and this is my placeholder text so I'm going to copy and paste that as a placeholder in my text area so that I don't have any typos so placeholder equals this text they've given me use the auto focus attribute so that the text area box receives the focus when the page so autofocus is going to say like your cursor's focus uh, this will be the first thing that will automatically receive the focus or receive the user's cursor okay so autofocus oops autofocus keyword it is an attribute and we really should be setting it as such But we're going to do, let me look this up real quick. Find out. Which is the preferred method for autofocus. Looks like just using the keyword is still the preferred method versus saying autofocus equals autofocus. Okay. So just the keyword for now. Next, set the tab index of the text area to one. The tab index is goes along with autofocus. And we can actually say that um, depending on the layout of our form, when somebody presses tab, that's going to go to the next uh, input on the form. And so we can set a custom index at, because depending on our layout, we may not want the user to go like maybe left, right, left, right. For example, we may want them to go all the way down one column and then all the way down another column. And so we may have to force that custom tab index. Um, so this one is asking us to do a tab index of one. That's going to be the first element in the tab index and set the wrap attribute to hard so that line returns are actually retained as part of the field value. So wrap equals hard. That's, that's all that setting is. And what that's going to do is when like it says, line returns. So when somebody actually types in an enter in that text area, 
it's going to save that value as part of the data that gets sent to the server. Okay, and then they have a note in here, do not include blank space inside the opening and closing text area or else the placeholder text won't appear correctly. So that means that I have to delete all that extra space that appears so that my text area will display properly. And then last on here, after the text area box, insert a paragraph containing this text right here. That's easy enough. Okay, just put that text into a paragraph. I didn't even have to read what it says. All right, so here is my text area. Right. In, in the example, it's going to be a lot larger, so we're going to have to style that somehow. But we can get that check mark for this step, and we'll probably come back to it later when we style things. Usually we build them and build everything and then style everything. Okay, next we have some field sets. Directly after the paragraph, insert a field set with the legend fonts that will be used to insert controls the user can use to select font styles. So if we look at this here, our field set has a legend of fonts and we're gonna end up customizing that or maybe it's customized already. We'll find out when we build it. All right, so we have a field set and this is gonna group a bunch of inputs together. inputs we've not created yet okay and a legend for this which operates similarly to a caption in a table this legend is supposed to say the word fonts with a capital f all right remember to get your capitalization correct otherwise MindTap does sometimes mark you as oops incorrect even when you have the otherwise correct information okay I closed my legend um, and we have more in here note in the steps that follow make sure you add both a name attribute and an ID attribute to each selection list giving the same value to both attributes. Also make sure that you enter the name and ID values in lowercase letters. Finally, make sure that every selection list has both option text and option values set to the same text string. So now they're telling us about the next step before we get to it. So I think the next step is gonna be a little difficult I need to get my check mark for this one before I move on. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to go backwards. All right. Next step within, we've got some knowledge about it a little bit. Within the fonts field set, all right, within this field set, insert the label font family followed by a selection list for the font family field add the following options to the selection list. And we have all these font options. These are different fonts. Select, set the option values equal to the option text, including the single quotes in the option value where required for the font name. So which one has a single quote in the name? Oh. All the ones with spaces have single quotes around them. Okay, so we'll put that in there. Let's go ahead and start um, within the fonts field set. First, we start with a label. And this label will be called font family that's the text in it 
So we're going to set, I'm gonna put a little space here, try and organize my code a little. And we're gonna have a selection list. So a selection list is called select. And this is gonna create like a, a drop down list. So in in order for us to create a drop down list, we need to insert all of the items that are going to be available in that list. And these are all the items. So there's going to be quite a few actually. Okay, then they've told us in the next step is to organize them generic font names versus specific font names. So the generic fonts are like serif, sans serif, monospace, cursive, uh, and fantasy. And then all the specific ones are the rest of these. These are individual fonts. Okay, so we can do that. Uh, each one of those is gonna be an option. I'm gonna go ahead and do all those first, do all the options, and then we'll group them together once we have all the options. So the default option first, option, default, we need to give it a value equals value, I mean default, excuse me, and then we need to give it the visual name for the user. The user sees this text and the server, the user sees this part in the text area and the server is going to see this part in the value. So that is one of them. And now we need to make a few more. The next is going to be serif. Okay, so I'll just copy and paste that. The next one is going to be sans serif. And then we have monospace next, my favorite font type, because that's what shows up when I'm programming, when I'm writing code. Then comes cursive, and then comes fantasy. Okay, and I'll put a little space in between all these groups here, and I'm going to copy and paste a few more. Now we can come in and do all the specific font types. So Arial, that's a specific font name. Book Antiquia is a font name. Now we can put single quotes inside of double quotes. That works. But if you look at the way this did, worked, they put a left curly quote and a right curly quote we don't want that we just want a regular single quote the left curly quote and the right curly quote are going to get encoded as some other value and that's not what we want we want a regular single quote in there okay and the next one is career new and i'll copy the whole thing and then we'll get rid of the curly quotes again. See, this one's going to have a left and a right curly quote in it as well. And I need to get rid of those and put in a regular single quote. Left and right curly quotes are very different than regular single quotes. Putting in the rest of the font names. I think I don't have any more quotes until I get down to Times New Roman. Then I'm going to have some more curly quotes. Okay, Times New Roman. And again, I'm going to get rid of the left and right curly quote. Looks like I missed the one on the right hand side anyway. Okay, so those are all my fonts, and it does say including the single quotes option value where required, and 
The reason for that is so that they can actually use this with the least amount of code. Um, I do hope that they're double checking before they use it. So now they've said at the last paragraph here, uh, enclose the generic font names in an option group, name generic, and the specific font names in an option group name specific. And I'm actually also going to leave the default out of any option group because it's the default. It doesn't quite fit into any of the option groups. So option groups are just called opt group, short for option group. And the attribute we set for that is called label. And we can label that um, with just some text and we'll call it the generic one we'll call generic and then we'll close the opt group at the end here and this will actually be displayed to the user as a group heading and we'll see that just a moment once i finish and this one's going to be called specific and we'll close this option group I think I have a typo here. There we go. All right, no typos because computers do not have the ability to correct your typos for you. Okay, so if I refresh my page here and I can see my font family select box and I have default, the first one on the list should be the default. That's the one that's automatically selected. And then when I open this, you can see that I can't, I can see the generic and the specific, but I can't select those. Those are just grouping containers. Okay. And then everything comes down here. What I would also like to do, um, it is not in the answer key. They've not done it here, but I would, so that everything lines up, I would take that default and put it in an option group without a label. See if I can do that. With no label. Just want to get the spacing to fit everything else. All right, so now default lines up with all the other selections. Okay, and I'm not sure if MindTap is going to agree with me or not. Let's try and get a check mark and see. It's taking a while. And it says no. And the reason is. I need to have 15 options in here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That's what I have. Oops. The picture looks good. 0% difference. Ah, I know what's incorrect here. Okay, I've missed an instruction. Font family. I did not mark my select group with any name or ID. Okay, and MindTap is specifically looking for that information. So ID equals, and they've told me that it's going to be font family right here okay all lowercase all one word and name is going to be the same thing all lowercase all one word and there was this note up here make sure um, 
In the steps that follow, make sure you add both name and ID attribute to each selection list, giving the same value to both attributes. Also make sure that you enter the name and ID values in lowercase letters. Finally, make sure that every selection list has both option text and option values set to the same text. So make sure that the selection has an ID and a name and they're both the same and they're all lowercase. All right. That's not required everywhere, it's just required for this assignment. Uh, and then make sure every option has both a regular text and a value and they're set the same. So actually slightly different because these ones with the quotes in them I'm not putting the quotes in the regular text. So that would be the only difference. All right. And now I can go ahead and get that checkbox. Now that I've ID'd and named my select properly, I should have no problem. And I do. Okay. Now we can move on to the font style. Hmm. Ah, okay. Now I'm going to have another selection list. This one is going to be called font style and it's going to have these options inside of it. Okay, no groups in this one, just the three options, uh, but I'm not gonna repeat myself, right? I have done it right one time. I'm gonna copy this entire selection, including the label, move a couple lines down, paste that whole thing, and then change whatever I need to change. So I only have one, two, three things in here. So I'm going to delete all the option groups and all the options except for three. Now I can change the wording. Instead of font family, it's font style. Instead of font family, it's font style everywhere that I need to. And then my options are going to be normal, italic, and oblique. So I'll copy normal, italic, and oblique. Okay, and if I have a look at that, font family, font style, it didn't go down to the next line, and that's because all the inputs are by default, they're inline elements and they'll just pile up in there. We're going to have to use some CSS style in order to correct that later. All right, we got that one. I was not expecting any trouble because we got the first one, font family, and we copied and pasted, okay? And then we just changed the text. So that was font style section. Okay, we're not actually setting any font styles or setting any font families. We're just building inputs for the user to pick font families and font styles. And we have font weight, decoration, variant. This is going to uh, play around with some text in there. Okay, so the next one is font weight. And the option values and option text will be just normal and bold. And of course, they did not highlight in the instructions what they are, but that's okay. So again, I'm going to copy and paste a previous one that I know was done correctly, and then I'm only going to change what needs to be changed. Okay, change all the markings from font style to font weight. And then change the values in the options. Oh, normal is already a value. So I can put it bold in for the next one. And there's only those two, normal and bold. So that's it for font weight.
There we go. The next one is going to be text decoration. There's a few more options for text decorations, but again, it's just more of the same. I'm going to copy and paste the previous one, change it from font weight to text decoration. Remember, my ID and my name should be the same, all lowercase, all one word. And then I'm going to paste, copy and paste my options in place. Make a couple extras. And all these should look familiar to you. These are actually things that we can set in CSS. Text decoration can be none, line through, overline, and underline. And these, are, these should all make sense. All right, that was text decoration. The next one is text transform. Text transform. And I just want to change my values again after I've copied and pasted. And text transform options are none is the first one, so no change there. And then capitalize. We want to transform our text to be capital, lowercase, or uppercase. The difference between capitalized and uppercase is one is all uppercase and one is just the first letter uppercase. And we have all these in here and they're just getting placed still in line, just fitting them in there. We don't have any styling. And the last one in this section, fonts variant. So again, I will copy and paste, change the words to font variant. Oop. Press the wrong key. Make sure that my ID and my name are all lowercase, no spaces. If you have a space in there on accident, it's actually going to set it to two separate values. Okay, my font variants are normal and small caps. Small caps is nice. It puts, makes your letters the size of lowercase letters, but shaped like capital letters. Okay, that's that set, font variant. I was getting a little bit ahead of myself. Now we've done the same thing like five, six times. The next step, colors, create a field set with the legend colors contain the following labels and input elements. So now, um, these ones are not going to be selects anymore. We finished that whole field set. And we're going to make a new field set. And we'll give it a legend of colors. Looking at our demo here, we finished this section. The next section we're going to do here, and this actually has color boxes. That's what we're going to build in here. Those we don't have to specifically code those like a lot. Okay, they're they're a thing that we already have available. So we need to label the 
color and the background color, the font color and the background color. So start with a label before we actually have the color chooser. Uh, so this one is going to be called font color and they also want it to say hexadecimal in parentheses. Of course, I didn't copy and paste, I usually do, but I got ahead of myself. Now I can do the input and it is going to be the input type will be color. And that's going to give us that whole drop down with the color chooser. Okay, um, so that's pretty cool. Remember, we want to give a name and ID to everything, and it's going to be called color in this case. So ID equals color, name equals color, and they've given us a default value. So value equals if the, if whatever you set as the value, the user can change that, but it will be the default value. And they've given us the hexadecimal code for black, just all zero, no red, no green, no blue. Okay. And that is everything set on that input. We need to also do a background color. So now I can use my friend copy and paste and change this from saying background color to or from font color to back ground color it's also going to say hexadecimal and everything is, else is going to be the same except its name won't be color it will be background color its type is still color uh, and this one is also going to have a placeholder. Placeholder, that's going to give us some uh, predetermined piece of text. A red, green, blue. Predetermined piece of text that we show to the user that looks like something but they won't be able to change that or or anything uh, it'll just appear temporarily until they set something so we'll have a placeholder for that one let's have a look at what that looks like now that we have that so the first one is the color this placeholder here i don't think is really doing anything for us in this background color one but we can drag these around to different things. All right, so the font color, there we go. Whatever you type in this top box, they already have the JavaScript programmed in. Now I can start changing things. Okay, and it will automatically appear in the rendered text down here. So very cool that they put the JavaScript in there for us so that we can actually play around with it in case we get bored halfway through our, our, our assignment here. But uh, I've done the colors, and I should be able to... Oh, it wants me to get a checkbox for two things all at once. Let's let's see what happens. I'm going to try the first one. I'm pretty sure it's not going to give it to me because it wants us to do two steps at once. That's kind of unfair. Yeah, two steps at once won't do it for us. So now we have to do all this legend sizes. That's this section over here. Right? We have to do all these sizes. So next we need yet another field set. OK, 
Okay, I have a field set, put a little space in it. Within, oh, I give it the legend, sorry. Legend called sizes. All right, within the sizes field set, insert the font size label. Following the label, insert a div element belonging to the slider class. Within the div element, insert a range slider with a field name and ID of font size. Have the value of the font size field range. Okay, so these are kind of all the attributes that go to that slider. Let's make the slider with the first half of this. Okay, so first is a label and that label is going to have font size right, let me get my capitalization correct all right that's the label following the label insert a div tag inside that div oh the div tag has class slider All right, this is going to be used for some CSS. I just know it. Within that div tag, that's where we insert the input of range. Range type. So input the type equals range. That's what they've said here. A range slider. The field name and ID will be font size. So ID equals font size, name equals font size, and then they're going to tell us about all these other options and attributes we have to set. So we have the basics of it right here. If we take a look, we have the font size slider already, okay? But now we need to set all these options. So have the value of the font size field range from 8 to 40 in a step of 1. And the way we do this, so tell me what the default should be. No, it doesn't. Doesn't tell me what the default should be. Oh, value of 14, right in front of my eyes. Okay, so I'm going to start with the default value, 14, and then the minimum of 8 and a maximum of 40. Min equals 8, max equals 40. All right, this will give me the low end of the slider and the high end of the slider, and the value would be the starting point of the slider. And they've said the step is going to be 1. Step equals 1. What that is is which level of increments. We can have it count by 1s. We can have it count by 2s, 5s, 10s, whatever we want it to count by. That's the step. Okay. Um, and so those are the attributes. And then they want us to insert the text of 8 on the left and 40 on the right. That way, because the, uh, the slider by default does not tell you what values are in there in any way, shape, or form. So we're going to program those values. We're going to type them in ourselves. So like they have here, they have an 8 and a 40 before and after the slider. And we have to type that in. So the default is 14. That's about right. That's probably exactly right. And as we slide this left and right, there it is. So if I was to change my font color, okay, I can change my font 
size. And there we go. All right, so that's working. Repeat the previous steps to create range sliders for the other typographical sizing styles that include text before and after the slider input control opening and closing tabs to show the ranges so all these other ones so we did font size we need to do letter spacing word spacing line height and text indent so we need to do four more i'll be doing them one at a time and i'm going to copy and paste again it's my friend put this in here and then change this to letter spacing. Oh, and I just noticed that I didn't put this little PX at the end of that one. So we'll do that. All right, this one's called letter spacing. So I changed the ID and the name. I just saw that I have a typo in ID. And so I have to fix it everywhere I've done that. It's dangerous to copy and paste when you have typos. This one, the field range from 0 to 10, 0 to 10, and I should change my text on the outside as well, 0 to 10, steps of 1 with a default value of 0. And so that's letter spacing. And next is word spacing okay letter spacing changes to word spacing and this has all the same settings 0 to 10 step of 1 default value of 0 so I don't have to change anything else on that one next is line height and this was going to be in EMs line height change the id and the name the id and the name that is definitely how they're targeting this with javascript okay uh, field range from zero to four and so i should change my values accordingly a step ooh, of 0 0.2 this time and a default value of 1, our line height should default to 1, otherwise our line height is going to be too small. And then text indent, I'm actually going to copy one of these other ones because I don't want the changes from line height to go in there. So text indent is the last one. Change all my IDs and names. And going to range from 0 to 10, which I have in there because I copied from word spacing, a step of 1 and a default of 0. So that should be all set for all of these here. Very good. Font size text indent, line height, word spacing, but just make everything as big as I can, and that's what it looks like. Okay, now I should have this correct, and I can get checked off for the last two steps in one on this page. Ooh, no. Let's see. Something wrong with my colors. It says the legend. Ah, I didn't give an ID to my field set. Did I give an ID to any of my field sets? I didn't. Right. I didn't say it earlier. 
All right, so this one, field set ID equals colors, and then I'll do sizes on the next one. And that's it. All right, now I should be able to get that. If you get something wrong in here, definitely look in here. All right, so field set of ID colors, and they're looking for the legend to have the word colors. I have that. I just didn't have the ID set, so I missed that. Now I have it corrected. There we go. Next page. Now we're going to forms.css because it looks like we have all of these form elements. Now we have to style the page. So we make our way to forms.css and it's a big empty. We're going to have to do all of it. Go to the field set style section. Create a style for all field set elements that removes the field set border, sets the width to 60%, sets the top and bottom margin to 10, left and right margin to zero. All right. Create a style for all field set. Remove the field set border that's border none, that removes the border, sets the width to 60%, okay, 60% width, set the top and bottom margin to 10 and the left and right to zero. So we can use the shorthand margin with two values. The top and bottom is first, 10 pixels, and zero is the last one, that's the horizontal. For every field set legend, create another style rule. We can do that. We can say field set legends, or because legends don't really exist anywhere else, except you and me, uh, we can set the style rule with just using the word legend. Okay, and this is going to set the background color. All right. Remember, if you're setting only the background color, we don't want to use the shorthand background. We do want to use background color specifically. And I'm going to copy and paste these numbers in there, 232, 232, and 232. So that's like gray. Sets the width to 100 percent and the top and bottom margin to two and the left and right to zero so we can use the shorthand for margin again two pixels top and bottom zero pixels left and right and remember zero doesn't need a unit unless it's time that's that's a requirement for the timed units but all the other units zero doesn't need the units we don't have to write pixels because zero pixels is the same as zero ems it's the same as zero anything else so what we've done here we've gotten a little bit we've got our field set and our legends very nice All right. Next, we have our div styles. Remember, we had a bunch of div elements inside of this field set over here, div class slider. So now all the div styles, go to the div style section, create a style rule for div elements of the slider class that floats the element on the left, sets the width to 60%, and sets the margin again. So we can do that. All the div of class slider. There may or may not be other elements of class slider. Uh, sets the class to float left. Float left. 
and an element that's floated gets pushed either left or right if it's floated left or right. Um, it kind of puts it out of normal flow. It is still in flow. There will still be room for it, but it operates a bit differently. Um, I encourage you to test it out and see what happens rather than just tell you because uh, if you don't see it for yourself, it's it's kind of one of those things you need to see for yourself. So width of 60 and the margin of two pixels in the top and bottom and zero pixels in the left and right. So that should be all these slider areas right here. Something happened there. That's kind of crazy. Right? I think that's what we're looking for, but we're going to have to do something with the labels of those. I'm not sure about that. That is right. That's what it's supposed to look like at the moment. Okay, go to the control style section. I think we're going to have to correct that. For all labels, yes, okay, all labels. Oop, typo. Create the following style rules. Create a style rule that floats the label on the left margin once the left margin is clear. Okay, so that means float left, but clear left. Okay, what this means is it's going to float to the left, but it's going to put in a line break so that it becomes the leftmost object on that line. Okay, it will clear the way to the left and will only go there once it's clear. Okay, it's not going to look right. It's going to look left, bring itself down, and then move over. Display the label as a block with a width of 40. So display block, this is going to change things a little bit for the float width of 40 percent and we're going to do the same margin we've done a couple times now of two pixels in the in the up top and bottom and zero pixels in the left and right so that's the label next we're going to do for all the inputs and select elements input and select elements Every time I do a comma and another selector, I do like to do a line break. It makes it much easier to read. Create a style rule that sets the top and bottom margins. Oh, we're only doing the margin this time, right? So I'm just going to copy and paste that. We've done it plenty of times now. Moving on to the next for the range slider inputs. So we can use the attribute selector on this one. It, the range inputs are inputs, but they are input, oops, input of type equal to range. So we can make a style that is just for the inputs that are of type range uh, and set their width to 60%. That's all we're setting for this one. Now, for all the selects, all the selection lists, create a style rule that displays the selection list as a block floated on the left and set to the width to 120 pixels. So block, it means display block, float left, they've said, and width of 120 pixels. Did I get that? Yep. Okay, we'll have a look at what all these do. We have two more to do. 
and we'll look at each one. For all input, input boxes that are the color type, so we did the range type. Next, we're going to do the color type. Now I'm going to copy and paste that, change it to color. Okay, we're not doing the width of 60%. We're doing display block, float left again, and set the width of this to 75 pixels. And things work better when you don't have typos. There we go. Okay, and the last one in this section, set text areas, text area boxes, font size to 1.5 EM, width of 100, so it will be 100% of that container, a height of 200 pixels, this is going to be for that top text area that we made, the very top, and a bottom margin of 15 pixels. Now the way we get the bottom margin is margin dash bottom, and then we won't set or reset any of the other margins that may or may not be set. Okay, so all of this, let's have a look at what we've done. We've set all the labels uh, remember they were like over here, so they've been floated left, display block, a width of 40%, uh, while these others are a width of 60%, and they have the same margin of 2 pixels and 0, like everything else has. Um, the ranges down here, we set those to a 60% width, the selects, we set all these to display block and float left. Remember the labels, we told them to clear left. So they're going to go all the way to the left. And the labels technically are written before the inputs. So the label goes all the way to the left. The input we did not tell to clear left. So it can actually stack on top of the label when, we, when the HTML when the browser reads to the next label, the next label is going to put itself on the next line, clear left, then it's going to show up, and then its input is going to float left and stack up against it, uh, and then the next label is going to come and clear left, go to the next line, and the same process will happen uh, repeatedly. And the text area, that's this bottom... I think this bottom one is good. We didn't program that one, but this top one, text area, we have a larger font size, width of 100% all the way over here, although the user can drag text areas, height of 200 pixels, and a bottom margin of 15 pixels. So that was a bit of a long step. Okay, and now the last step on this page, we're actually going to style the placeholders of the text area. Okay, go to the placeholder style section. In this section, you'll create a style for the placeholder text within the text area box. That is this text up here, which I can't grab onto because it's a placeholder. Using the WebKit, Mozilla, and Microsoft browser extensions, create three style rules for placeholder text within text area boxes that sets the background color to this color, sets the font color to this color, and sets the font size to 1.5 EM. So I happen to know that MindTap is using only a WebKit browser. So I'm going to do that one first and see if maybe that's the only one I have to do for this assignment anyway. So text area, the placeholder is 
right here. So this is the normal placeholder with no prefix, text area, double colon, placeholder. Now we've got to do the WebKit version. So I scroll all the way down to WebKit uh, input placeholder. And we're going to give it the background color that they've stated here, which is RGB 255, 255, 191. And I want to put a little space in here because I know web uh, MindTap tends to look at RGBs uh, with code instead of with a picture. Um, then we have to set the color value to RGB of 255 comma 151 comma 151 and then last the font size of 1.5 em or one and a half times the normal font size for that element there we go so this is working because I'm using a WebKit browser right now. I'm using Chrome. And MindTap is also a WebKit browser. So I may be able to just do the one. And I can just do the one. But if you want to do all of them, we can do text area and Microsoft. Where is it at? It's MS. I don't see it. MS input placeholder. And the Mozilla one is just Mozilla placeholder. And I have too many colons here. So we can do them all the same. There we go. If you want to do all of them. And now I can get the last test. And there we go. It looks like my placeholder text is not displaying properly there. But I got it anyway with a 0.44% difference. Let's see if I can get rid of the other ones, see if that makes a difference for this final test. It does. Okay. So if you want to put all three of them in, you may have to put them in this way rather than combine them into one rule. Okay. And there we go, I can get that placeholder. And to future proof it, I would go ahead and do standard placeholder at the end for browsers that don't need a prefix. Give that a check one last time. Should work. Yep, because any browser that doesn't understand any one of these, just gonna skip it. So if you wanna separate all of them, then it is going to work and I get, oh, I still get a 0.19% difference. I don't get that highlighted picture, but I can't see. Ah, 
there's the difference. The background color element is not defaulting to that placeholder color that we put in there or whatnot. It's going directly to a black color for the background. Ah, I think I typed that in incorrectly. It was supposed to be background of white by default. Why didn't anyone tell me that? <laughs> there we go. Now I got that. It's still got a 0.11 difference. I don't see where it is. I don't see where it is, but 0.11 difference. All right, and that is MindTap T7 Case Problem 3, the Widget Mage. Right, there is the final result. You can actually play around with this and put text in here. And then you can hit these buttons and it will show up on the bottom. We can change the colors, small caps, all that good stuff. All right, pretty fun. And that will be the end of the video.